Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Today, as we start on this very exciting webinar with a very exciting lineup of panelists that I have with me out here, let's start. And as I introduce each of these panelists and the topic to you for today, artificial intelligence, as we know, is playing a transformational role in the way we operate contact centers and deliver today. With the rise in chatbots, virtual assistants, and automated systems, AI is revolutionizing the way business handle customer interactions, provide real-time support, and deliver exceptional customer service each time. But with such rapid evolution in AI and technology in contact centers, it's crucial to strike a balance between AI and real empathy. We need to answer questions like, does the customer really want to be handled by a bot every time? Or do they expect human intervention while providing real-time solutions or resolutions to customers at every touch point want digital intervention? It's hence this interactive session that we have today where we'll touch upon each of these questions and, and brainstorm about you know, what do they really mean for the future of the contact center industry. Now, here are some stats uh, to throw in and to trigger off this particular conversation. Now, according to Gartner, AI-driven contact centers can reduce call center costs by 80 billion in the next three to four years. A recent survey predicts that AI will power 95% of customer interactions by 2025. The global call center AI market is projected to reach 10,000 million by 2030. Will it actually happen? All these statistics, all these numbers, what are your thoughts? The panelists that we have out here, as well as the, the audience that has registered for this particular webinar. That's the question for all of us. Do we agree that AI will be playing a transformational role in the CX space of CX management and global contact centers? And let's further go ahead and have this particular debate with the panelists who are out here with me. Without any further ado, let's straight away get into our exciting panel discussion on how AI can drive contact centers of the future. And for this, let me introduce you to our distinguished panel today. To begin with, let's go to our first speaker. We have Japneet Pedi, so who handles patient access services with Alkermis. You can see her entrepreneurial background for the last 20 years and the experience in biopharma industry. Currently, Japneet is the Executive Director of Patient Access Services at Alchemist in Watham, responsible for defining and executing vision and strategy for patient access services. Welcome, Japneet, to today's session. Thank you, Himanshu. Thank you for the great welcome. Wonderful, Wonderful to have you. Next up on the lineup is Michael Gamel, consultant in the education industry. As you can see from his bio, he has more than 30 years of experience, hands-on experience in the educational industry. He has set up homework health centers and online proctors to assist students and examination, uh, examiners to take advantage of new technologies. Michael also advises governments on education policy and execution, and he also works with both private and public schools. Welcome aboard, Michael. Great to have you on today's panel. Thank you, Himanshu. Yep, and next up, I have Praveen Chadda, a veteran with about 20 years of experience in the entire contact center space uh, in the field of transformation, operations, new client acquisition, sales, clients, account, onboarding, transition. Uh, he's somebody whom we look up to when it comes to CX transformation, analytics, management, and consulting. Uh, he has been leading transformational changes across businesses relying on new age tech uh, and with the focus coupled with client-centric delivery, skilled and service level agreements. Welcome to the panel. Uh, I'm sure you will be bringing in a lot of insights, Praveer, in today's discussion. Thank you, Manshu, for having me here. I appreciate it. Fantastic. And finally, it's your truly, uh, yours truly, uh, Himanshu Mandro, Head of Solutioning, at Datamatics. So I bring about 20 years of experience in the space of consumer insights, market research, both qualitative and quantitative research, and business analytics. 
have worked with organizations like Prudential, uh, startup organizations, Willis Towers Watson, uh, the insurance broking giant. Now, these are the organizations where I have led and built teams from scale knowledge services team in the space of analytics, CSAT, NPS research. Uh, I've also been conducting lectures and, you know, I've been a visiting faculty and speaker uh, at multiple B schools as well as, as well as at tech giants. So I think this is what the entire lineup we have today. Our panelists, let's, uh, you know, get started with the session. Uh, and as we go on, here is a quick survey for you, all of you, to trigger this conversation. Can we have the survey on the screen, please? Now, this is for the audience who has joined here. I'm sure you have your expectations from this panel discussion. Uh, but before that, we would like to gain your thoughts as well to baseline what is it that our audience is expecting and what is it that they think about the entire CX space and the role of AI. Now, here's a quick poll. Uh, we want a single answer from you. So from a CX perspective, what do you think is the biggest business priority that can be addressed with artificial intelligence? You have your five options out there, and it's just to see you know, what are the larger trends looking like, what is our audience thinking about CX and AI currently. We'll give it about 30 seconds. You can pick up your answer. And then let's see, actually, you know, the answer on the screen, what are the results looking like? How is it the percentage, the pie chart stacking up? <clears throat> okay, we see the results. So the biggest one, actually, it's a close tie. It's a neck on neck between delivering omni-channel customer experiences, the biggest customer priority, as well as improving responsiveness from an agent perspective. I throw it open, this discussion, to our panelists. You know, as we see the numbers out there, uh, so clearly it's the omni-channel customer experience, as well as improving responsiveness that's leading the race big time over all others. Uh, any quick thoughts on that, Praveen, as we see these results? You think this is in line with what you were expecting? I think it's uh, pretty interesting that uh, the two major topics that are picked up for deliver experience and improve uh, responsiveness. Yeah. Because the rest of the answers that you have actually flow down from here. So I think the audience has pretty much hit, it, hit the nail on the head on uh, what everyone does expect from AI today. Now, how do we expect it? I think uh, there's lots to be discussed and uh, lots to be channeled over the months and years to come, that how do we get the best out of AI from a responsiveness and customer experience? Because both go hand in hand, but at the same time, there are questions that are coming up whether both of them can survive at the same time. Are they linear, parallel, or are they conflict in each other? Wow. Well said, Praveen. And that brings me to my first question over to you, Japni. Now, being in this entire biopharma space, what do you think is the current status of AI in the pharmaceutical industry? And along with that, if you could also throw some light on what are some challenges AI-powered processes can face in the pharma industry? What do you uh, think? Thanks for the thanks for the question, Himanshu. Before um, answering, I I do want to thank uh, Datamatics for um, including me in this webinar. This is such a hot topic. Um, it's consistently in the news, um, especially in the pharma space. Um, uh, pretty much every week, there's a story coming out about how AI is set to kind of transform the pharmaceutical industry. Um, I do want to point out, though, AI, I, I know we're talking a lot about AI today, um, uh, but it's been around for a really long time. Um, the first time uh, in pharma that AI was um, touched upon was 1950. Um, and, yeah. you know, obviously it wasn't as evolved as it is today, but that just goes to show that this has been in the making for a really long time. So it, it's really evolved. 
Um, as far as uh, AI in pharma goes, um, there's actually a lot of big pharma pharmaceutical companies that have implemented AI in their drug discovery process. They're using AI for um, gaining insights and decision making. Um, they're using it to design clinical trials, um, and you know they're doing all of this faster, a lot faster, because with the with, with AI and machine learning, they can um, analyze huge amounts of data and um, uh, come up with uh, recommendations really quickly uh, for the humans to then follow through on, right? Um, so, um, you know, I, I wanted to make sure that our audience knows that AI didn't just show up overnight. I know um, ever since chat GPT kind of came into mainstream news, uh, people are like, wait, where did this come from? But um, AI has been um, around for, for some time. And and I um, I believe we are close to, um, uh, we, we should soon see a drug uh, in um, approved uh, by the FDA, which was originally uh, either identified or discovered or invented uh, by AI. I know there are some um, uh, molecules that are in a human testing already. So, you know, so a lot of inroads have been made uh, with AIs. Um, your, your second part of the question, Himanshi, was challenges. It comes with a lot of challenges. Um, first of all, AI relies on data. Right. So if your data set is not robust, if it's not complete, if it's not uh, represent, fully representative, um, you're not going to get the right um, outcomes. You're not going to get the right recommendations. So uh, data integrity is going to be huge um, with pharma um, and you're dealing with patient data. You're dealing with HCP data. Um, data privacy is a big concern um, and a regulatory framework. I, I'm not. Um, um, very well versed with how far the regulatory framework has come along when it comes to AI, but um, you know those are kind of some of the things that I see uh, right off the bat. Interesting, interesting. And and before you know, I'm eager to come to you, Michael, but I'm also eager to gain Praveer's thought on this particular challenges uh, that Japneet has highlighted about uh, you know the regulatory impact, the compliance, uh, you know with. With greater power comes greater responsibility, as we know, right? So AI also brings in a lot of risks and potential challenges. Uh, what are your thoughts, uh, having seen this, you know, up close and personal, uh, Praveen? I the think, uh, yes, yes, greater power, you know, comes with greater responsibility, no doubt about that. I think, are you quoting Game of Thrones, if you want, uh, <laughs> or any of the others? That's pretty fine with that. But, I, you know what, I... I I kind of uh, agree with what Japneet is saying, you know, uh, because AI does rely on a lot of data and information. And when I was in school, this could be, you could look at my hairstyle and say it's about 30 years ago or maybe more, uh, but not that much. It's just my hairstyle. It, we used to call it Gigo, garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. So whatever you feed into a computer is what you get out of it. So absolutely the integrity of data, the integrity of uh, information that is fed and how um, AI is controlled and modulated and how it is managed is going to be absolutely key, critical, and important. However, at the same time, uh, I would like to say that, yes, there are risks and there are risks with everything that we do and that we have done. I mean, with the advent of new technology, when we came out with new programs, uh, people started coming up with new viruses. And then we came out with virus programs and then people came out with uh, the next level of virus programs and antivirus, so and so forth. So uh, what we try to obviously continuously do is stay ahead of the curve. We understand there are certain risks that will come with AI, that will come with any new technology that's coming to the market. AI is not a new technology, totally understand that, but the advent that has happened over the last six months with the speed it has grown and the speed it is consuming data and information, the world will be very different in the next five years. The speed of evolution is gonna absolutely change from um, a, you know, a data perspective or from any perspective. I mean, you would not imagine that, we have, would not have imagined 20 years ago, some of you would have seen Back to the Future Part 1, Part 2, Part 3, would not have realized that what you see there on the phone, people talking to each other, flying cars, all the good stuff, is, is coming to reality in the phone. And in the next five, 10 years, it will be totally a different world altogether. So yes, we will embrace and we are embracing AI technology. There are risks there, and as Japneet pointed out, at the same time, 
there are mitigants to the risks that are going to come up. So from a perspective of the contact center, uh, if there are risks, and then how do we work around that? How do we ensure integrity of data and information? How do we ensure that the information that is coming out, is there a second or third level of check? You know, you can even train AI to check itself. I actually tried that using one of the tools in Chatbot 4 to check, chat, uh, sorry, ChatGPT 4 to check ChatGPT 3's information actually works. So mm -hmm. you can use AI to also monitor AI. And at the same time, that's where the human in the digital comes in. The human still does not disappear. The human just becomes a smarter human. It, I would say is the evolution of the human uh, along with the evolution of uh, data and AI that we are seeing here. Prabir, if I may just add to that, I think, you know, with AI, it, it's mimicking human intelligence. So you cannot take the human out of it. And I, and I love how you said it. It's, it, it's making the human smarter. It, it's going to change our focus. Um, but it's, it's here to stay and it's here to transform. Absolutely with you, Japni. Yeah. Thank you for that. Evolution of the human, right? Smarter human uh, and human will remain, right? Uh, human, yeah. uh, the smarter one of the both the species, I believe so. Yeah, but 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 I mind you keep the Darwin's theory out of it. Don't go into that and say you know now it's the evolution <laughs> of the human from a Darwin perspective. Yeah, let's not <laughs> go one thousand years ago, right? <laughs> Earlier. Yeah. <laughs> and that brings me, you know, from one part of the spectrum, from the pharma industry to what you have been witnessing, uh, Praveen, uh, to the other part of this entire panel, which mm -hmm. is the education sector. Yeah. Uh, so what is customer experience, candidate experience, student experience uh, in the education sector? Uh, Michael, this one is for you. Uh, so how is this entire sector evolving and implementing AI? I'll, I'll keep it simple and I'm sure yeah. you will bring in the perspectives. Yes. Well, first of all, as, as the education person, I'm glad that you started off the session with a test. Um, and, and, and I would have answered the question a little bit differently because education, and, and this is a bit of irony, education is the last to come to the party when it comes to technology. Um, you know, you've got uh, fintech, you've got obviously pharma, as Jeff Neat talked about, and, and so many other industries. And, and education is a bit of the laggard. And what I would have answered in that poll would be more scale because what a teacher does isn't uh, necessarily rocket science, but it's that experience that comes after years and years and years of teaching and training. And so the challenge in education has typically, among many other things, but typically has been scale. So by taking advantage of, of technology and certainly AI enabled tools allows that scale to happen so that students get more personalized learning, right? Personalized learning is the big buzzword or buzz phrase that, that um, permeates education. And one of the ways to help with a more personalized learning experience and to help scale what a, a fantastic teacher can deliver. And think about it, we've all had fantastic teachers, but you know what? We've all had teachers that weren't as good and we can ramp up <clears throat> the ability of perhaps a newer teacher uh, or a less skilled teacher taking advantage of, of these AI enabled tools. And I have to comment on both what Jepneet and Prevere talked about with this, which is this human thing. Um, you know, every now and again, you'll get a teacher that says, oh my gosh, am I gonna lose my job uh, to an AI? No, 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 no. A teacher will never lose his or her job to AI. But I will say this, a teacher who does not use AI, a teacher who does not understand AI will lose their job to a teacher who does know AI, who does use AI. So we really need to embrace these tools so that we can have a better learning experience for students, uh, empower teachers to do what they do best, which is of course teach rather than have them do a bunch of administrative things that AI now can do and do very, very well. So it is a slow evolution. It's getting there, um, but it's something that that absolutely needs to happen in the education space. Uh -huh. Interesting. Michael, so, but I'm curious, you, you mentioned about, you know, we have all seen teachers, great teachers and not so great teachers. What does this spell for not so great teachers? Well, remember that, yeah. yeah. Would be losing their jobs? 
Well, the thing is, is this could help ramp up their ability to become that amazing teacher that we've all that we've all had. Because remember that that we might hear about AI. Oh, I'm worried about students using chat GPT to cheat on their exams. Well, what about the other side? What about utilizing AI tools to help a teacher become better, help better train? Um, I, I was I was talking earlier with some colleagues about homework help centers. Now, remember, in education, we don't call it a contact center and we don't call it an agent, but we but it's the same thing. We have educators helping students. And the whole goal is to help more students the best we possibly can and to be able to have at our fingertips the things that an AI can serve up so that, again, me, the human, the educator in dealing with a, a student or even a teacher can bring that immediately and that's what I'm talking about is how we can improve a person's skill, whether that person is the teacher or whether that person is the student uh, and improve them on, on really an, a rapid scale. That's that's empowering. Wonderful. So, Michael, so if, I, if I can just uh, yeah. sorry, please, Himanshu, I just please, wanted please, to please. build on uh, what Michael was saying with the uh, analogy of the agent. I agree. I think with. With the agents, um, it's on us to figure out how to use AI and make mm -hmm. the agent's role more impactful and more relevant, quite frankly, right? We can leverage AI, right. uh, whether it's a contact center or a call center or it's um, a teacher or any job, quite frankly, right? right. Um, I, I don't know who, I, I can't uh, recall the name of the person who said this, but I, I follow it a lot. It's you either lead or you follow or you get out of the way. And I think that's what's going to happen with AI. Like you, you're going to have to pick a side, right? And I don't think people are going to lose jobs to um, AI. But like uh, Michael said, you're going to lose your job to a person who knows AI, who's embraced AI, right? It, yeah. It's um, and, and I would say get ahead of it. Learn how to use AI to make yourself better and more relevant. Yeah, you that genie's out of the bottle. You can't stuff it back in. No. So let's <laughs> let's embrace it. Let's be very mindful of the challenges and risks. I mean, Japneet, you talked about data privacy, certainly on the education side, student privacy, student yeah. data privacy is very, very key. So, so that's similar. Um, but let's embrace it. Let's not let's not be too uh nervous about what if this goes bad. Let's be appropriately cautious but what if this goes well i mean let's think of that let's think of the glass being so much half full rather than half empty and and really when you do that it's amazing what you can think of in terms of the opportunities and i think through that point you know what you and japanese both mentioned right now interesting point of the evolution and and people uh teachers and agents and, and assisting and helping uh learning more so, you know, uh, I think we, we've embarked on a journey where we are telling all our employees and others as well, whoever we meet, you know, get trained on the new AI model. And we are putting in training plans for all those folks so that they are more effective in the role that is going to come to them. So it is there. Absolutely love the analogy that you put in the genies uh, out. The glasses, I would not say the glass is half full or half empty. I, I'm a very positive man. I'll always say the glass is always full, my friend. And, and just move on. It, it is there to stay. It is going to be there. So, and embrace it. The change is coming. It's a big change, huge change. How do we work through it and bring the best customer experience to the fore is, is, is the key critical point. So we need to train. You need to train the teachers. You need to train the physicians. We need to train people in the contact centers. And that's what's going to happen over the next years to come. Get them to be the best of what they can be in this new environment. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Praveer, there there are physicians that are using AI to help them with diagnosing yeah. disease, right? Um, yeah. And why not? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And similarly, you know, we've got students who are struggling, and to pinpoint or to diagnose exactly where they need help. Well, sometimes we mere mortals can't determine that. Yes, there are amazing teachers who have so many years of experience who can do that. But like I said, those years of experience, so <clears throat> that just takes years. So then you have a newer teacher who may not have that skill. They could take advantage of these tools to better diagnose where a student is having trouble 
and that empowers the teacher. The student, of course, now has a very positive experience. They see success. Um, and that's, of course, a very wonderful thing to see, just as I'm sure, Japneet, you know, your example where where you have a, an accurate diagnosis, a diagnosis, the difference between an inaccurate one and an accurate one, it could be life and death in your industry. Yeah. yeah. I believe, uh, Michael, that the glass is the glass is <clears throat> uh, the glass called AI. Right. And it's just getting more intelligent by each passing day. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. So. Michael, Praveer, Japneet, I think, you know, just like I have, you know, lots of questions, uh, you know, that I need to ask uh, each one of you. Uh, and so goes, uh, you know, true for our, holds true for our audience as well, which is out here. And I'm sure, you know, they have multiple questions as well uh, that they, they would want to ask uh, uh, either of you uh, about education, about pharma, about contact centers, the customer experience part of it. Uh, so for our audience, uh, guys, We'll be uh, having this entire panel discussion for the for 45 minutes. The 60 minutes that we have for today's webinar, the last 15 minutes we have, uh, you know, specially allocated to our audience uh, for a Q&A. What you can do is hold on to your questions so that we go on with the flow currently the, in the current discussion. Uh, maybe you know, hold on to your questions, keep posting it on the Q&A window that you see out there, uh, and we can start picking it up. Uh, when we come to the, the last 15 minutes of this session. So just keep sending your question on the Q&A window uh, and we'll start looking at them towards the, the final part of this entire panel discussion. Yeah, sounds fair. Uh, and I believe uh, it's time now that we have triggered this entire discussion uh, and we started off with a survey, why not have another survey in this uh, panel discussion, uh, which again is an interesting one. Uh, so let me see my team bring it up and take this discussion to the second part as we go ahead. Let's see. So here's the question. And this one is more about the evolution, uh, the smarter humans, the next stage, where is it all headed towards? So where is AI headed and how will it impact CX? We heard the business priorities, the biggest business priorities to start off with. And now this is your thoughts of where do you think we are headed towards? Will AI lead us to improved consumer insights? I think you, you, you keep getting better with the insights uh, that you want to understand about your customers and consumers. Will it lead to more personalized customer experiences? Will it free up human resources as uh, Michael was mentioning, right? Uh, you've got to get better each passing day. Uh, because machines are able to do your job much better than what you were doing so far. Uh, will it lead us to sharper is issue resolution across industries? Uh, and then out there is, will it help <coughs> mitigate risks? Will our risks keep getting lesser and lesser and tackled more efficiently with the future of AI? Now, what do you think? Again, it's a, it's a single coded one because we want to see a conclusive response. We want to see the, the trends and the patterns and how does the pie stack up? So let's give it another 30 seconds and then let's see the results. Which, which one would you pick, Japneet or Praveer, or you want to hold on to your opinions currently or Michael, uh, so that not to influence the audience? Um, I'm, I'm gonna hold on from my perspective. Yeah. There's <laughs> lots in my mind around all of these. Well, let the audience poll come in. Okay. Well, I, I'll, I'll jump in and, and I'll give the answer. For, for, uh, for those on the education side, it is that personalized experience. Again, we talk about personalized learning. Um, so anything that you can do to more humanize yeah. it, which, by the way, is in the topic, is in the title of this whole session, right? We're not talking about getting rid of the human and we're not talking about getting rid of that human experience. We're talking about how technology can actually improve it. Uh, and at least on the education side, that's, that's what I sort of uh, focused in on. Michael, are you trying to influence folks? Do you have people on your side? <laughs> hey, see how much you are able to influence, right? Uh, All right, there you go. It's almost there, Michael. You have swayed it quite a bit. Yeah. So this one out there is freeing up human resources. Maybe that's the earlier part of what you were mentioning, Michael, right? Uh, so that's yeah, the, the leader of yeah, the Yeah, and, that, and that's part of it, right, is, is how can technology help people um, do the things that they're better at, right? So for example, if a teacher is stuck doing administrative work, 
well, then that teacher is not teaching. Mm -hmm. And so then AI can help that part. Um, yep. So for example, in, a, in my homework help, uh, in the homework help centers, I want to make sure that my educators are getting maximum value, that the students are getting maximum value from the educators who are helping answer these homework help questions. Well, something like a nice piece of technology to help with a couple initial questions from, from the student's perspective will then route that student query to the best person to help that student. Um, and that's what I would say is that freeing up the human resource. So they're not spending their time doing that again, diagnosis. Yeah. And then instead they're able to help more students. Yeah. And so I think what you're saying, thing, Michael, is freeing yeah. up human resource time, not resources. I would, Correct. you know, just differentiate the there a little bit. Because I think, function, uh, you know, as you're right. yeah, as, as we are discussing, you know, making the human resources smarter, to do uh, better level jobs and be better at what they do. Right? So, I mean, I mean, absolutely agree with the entire, uh, you know, poll that's come out. Yeah. Uh, customer experience, personalized, and, and that's one of the key things. CX, customer experience, the way you want it, is, 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 is my tagline and our tagline. And that is going to be so enhanced and so to tune with the advent of AI, and, and I've got a million thoughts on it. I, I, I don't want to take away your entire time, Himanshu. Yeah. I know you told us you've got only an extra time. I have time a previous question for you, and I can't uh, you know, resist myself for asking is uh, the mitigate risk part of it. That was, you know, out there just 4%. Does that comes as comes up as a surprise, uh, a revelation? Why is risk not being seen, you know, something that can be resolved through AI? So the interesting part is uh, mitigate risk through AI, when you address the factor that uh, customer experience the way you want it, if you're delivering that, you yeah. are mitigating the risk. So I think the our, our entire audience is pretty smart on that, not choosing something which is an outcome, which, which is anyway a given of something which you're going to deliver. Because yeah. if you're going to deliver customer experience the way you want it and, and you know the human resources, if you're going to enhance them, yeah. then you are anyway mitigating risk on the other side. So, so I, I really applaud everyone who's answered that question. Yes, some people who did answer that, I think, I think your view on that is simple that, uh, yes, AI can be utilized to mitigate risks that might be existing today in current environment, and that can come in today. I'm, I'm an example. If some, you know, let's take a, like a, let's take a fraud, right, in an in uh, insurance sector or a banking sector or, or any of the financial sectors, so AI and club AI with blockchain technology, I'm telling you, it'll be almost impossible for anyone, not impossible, almost impossible for anyone to copy anyone's identity and try to cheat out of the way. Because you're looking at artificial intelligence leaning into different blocks of data lying all across, which will actually tell you what's happening today and, and whatever, you know, whatever you try to cheat out of people, it, it, it's going to be so difficult. So yes, uh, you know, I, I won't say people have disregarded that. I will take it that uh, people have accepted that it's a part and parcel of the given. Very interesting. So, Praveer, I know this is something that you are passionate about, and I want to bring in Japneet mm -hmm. once again out here. We are talking about personalized experiences. We are talking about uh, you know human resources getting augmented, right? Getting better or freeing up their time. Now, here's something, Japneet. Uh, you have been running contact centers uh, in your space. Uh, how can AI-driven contact centers maintain or enhance personalized interactions and also enable relationship management, which is a big one, right? Do you think somewhere AI tends to reduce uh, the relationship management part of it or is it the other way around? What are your thoughts about it? I think AI helps. Um, we, uh, we're we actually starting to implement uh, some AI technology ourselves where uh, number one, you take away the administrative burden, right? Um, you start with the basics. So call center, you get a call, you can use AI to intelligently route it to the right place the first time. No one wants to go through a call tree and hit different options and wait and then land with someone that they didn't need to speak with and then start the cycle all over again. It's the most frustrating thing. Um, so I think AI can kind of really help with that. Um, so you start at the very beginning, they help with the call routing. Now, 
if someone's talking to a human agent, then you can use AI to help that human agent with um, uh, uh, on the on the spot kind of recommendations and maybe prompts um, to kind of help them answer the question more efficiently and faster, right? Um, so that you're keeping the customer engaged, you're you're satisfying the customer's query, um, and then you can also use AI to um, observe the tone. Um, the reaction of the uh, of the caller in this example, um, and give some real time feedback and coaching and training to the agent so that they're not waiting until the end of the week or the end of the month to get trained and coached. It's all happening real time, so they're getting better and better. Um, and I, I think the human element is so important here. Um, all along this journey, I think you use AI to get better, um, and then you strike a balance where. Um, you use AI to the extent you need it, and then you escalate to a human um, when it's relevant, right? Yeah. Um, I've been stuck in uh, on phone calls where I know it's AI, and it's so frustrating, and I'm screaming at the phone. I just want to talk to an agent, um, and my family thinks I've lost it. But it sometimes works. You say agent five times, and they actually will connect you to a live person is what I've found. Yeah. Um, so um, I think AI can definitely enhance uh, that customer satisfaction um, and customer engagement because um, you know that that's really the goal of the call center, to be able to answer the questions uh, fast and accurately. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I'll, I'll add on to that. It, what you describe is 100% the case in an education situation where we're routing the student to the person who can best help that student. And that could be, again, a homework help situation, or it could be a, a proctoring, a proctoring situation where uh, the proctor is now empowered to be able to help more people because of what's available um, at one's fingertips uh, through that AI. Now, I should also say that in the education side, uh, and Praveer, you talked about data and then how that data is being used. There's there's some work that's being done where we're actually capturing biometric data in addition to others to put that into the mix so that we can be gauging the reactions of students. For example, a stress reaction if they're not understanding a concept and they're feeling a little bit, uh oh, am I the dumb kid in the room who doesn't understand this question? But then being able to help ease their concerns, help be able to explain things so that that student can become more confident. But it's all data driven and it's utilizing a <clears the> technology <throat> that did not exist before that can only improve that, uh, in this case, student experience, which would be the customer experience. You know, the, the, the fact that we, we bring up data all the time, yes, yes, data, and, and we need to understand, sometimes usually data is, is numbers plus minus one. Sometimes data is information that we've gathered. But Michael, thanks for bringing what you brought up. Data is all information captured. Even when we are smiling and talking today, it's being yeah. captured on a video, is, is data. And uh, we are talking, it is data, our emotions it being captured as data. Everything that gets converted or captured as data. So the way AI is uh, working across today and even across the entire contact center space and others, so I feel, you know, you know and, and that's the way we're working, to augment the entire experience that is being provided by a human today. So the human stays within the mix and becomes actually an agent in the contact center, becomes a super agent with the advent of AI and AI support. So you, you just think of it, you know, I always say to my folks, you think of Batman. Batman is a normal person and a normal human being, but with technology, you know, the fast car, the beautiful bats and everything else, he's become a Superman. And that is where AI comes into the mix to provide, make our agents and contact center specialists super people at their job or anywhere you look at the education sector or the healthcare sector or travel sector, any other sector that you're talking about, they make them super at the job that they're doing. And that's where the human in the mix continues to stay and evolve. I mean, from our perspective, you know, Japneet mentioned IVR. When the IVR flows in, the AI is absolutely capable of profiling the type, the person who's calling in who, what he had or she had, or they had called for earlier, what they are calling for now, what has in, you know, transpired with them within the organization, route them to the right person who has the right skill uh, to do the job, 
give them the right tools, one-stop shop, fix it. And I will say, you know, a lot of times, is AI is the right answer for every resolution, every query that somebody might have? No. AI is not the right answer. Digital is not the right answer for every query. Where empathy comes in, where the love for my conversation comes in, I do want to talk to a human and get it sorted out. So the, the concept is, what can you deflect? What can you automate? And what can you digitize? That's why the entire AI comes in. Post that, whatever queries and whatever information or help that we need is where the human comes in. So, so interestingly, that is what leads to providing customer experience the way you want it. Mm -hmm. Praveer, yeah. to add to that, um, I think relationship management, I don't want AI deciding how to manage a relationship with my customers. Yeah. I want yeah. AI to augment it, but I, I don't want uh, AI to be responsible for it or be accountable for it, right? Yeah. Um, it's the people. And by making our people super people, I really love, I think you should patent that term. AI is going to make people super people. Uh, I think they can do that. They can give uh, the relationship, the time it needs, right? Um, and Prabir, your organization and my organization, that's what we've done, right? We've taken the repetitive out of the yeah. box. We've yeah. given uh, the people the time they need to focus on complex situations, to focus on relationships, to focus on our customers. Um, and, um, you know, that, that, that partnership is working really well and we're seeing results. We're seeing quantifiable yeah. results. Yeah. And imagine if you're talking to a customer and, and at any level, right? And you have all the required information, whatever's going on, whatever's happened, whatever's going on, uh, you know, in the industry, what's the best case scenario possible? The customer's really going to be much more happier with the resolution that you're going to provide because you're giving, you're not saying, hey, let me, hold on, let me talk to my supervisor or hold on, uh, I'm going to come back to you tomorrow. Let's have another meeting about it save so much time, effort. It's a faster and a quicker resolution. With this changing world, we should also look at the human needs, right? The human needs are changing faster than we're imagining. Uh, I would not have imagined having an Alexa in my home about 20 years ago, right? Today, I just say, Alexa, I want some music. It just plays on. I'm not even looking at it. So, so the beauty of things is you don't have time for a lot of stuff and AI helps you save the time. Does that take it out of the mix? It makes us more smarter, as you said. At the same time, the human touch, absolutely still. I mean, we were all, all in the pandemic COVID mode, right? And, and yeah, it was okay. But now everybody wants to get out and meet people. Can we not do it online? We can. But we still love to travel, sit down across that meeting, which could have lasted two hours. Today lasts only about 30 minutes because we've got all the information on our hands. And that's what AI is going to do tomorrow and today as well. Yeah, yeah you know, I'd like to. Parts of our audience is changing too. Like I, I look at the new generations, right? Like I look at my kids. They, they, they don't know what it means to answer a phone call. Right? <laughs> they're more like, why are you calling me? That's weird, right? They just, they're more like digital or texting or you know Snapchat or whatever other social media True. applications they use. So, so there's that kind of generation coming too. Yes. But I think they'll quickly recognize you can't, you can't use social media to replace the human touch. Um, and maybe they'll mature into that or maybe not. But I think um, our landscape is changing as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll jump in on that, too, because, again, working with students as I do, it is changing and it is that personal touch, that that human interaction, that relationship management, as you described it, Japneet. And and I want to thank Datamatics for for inviting me and even thinking about bringing education into this context. Right. Again, when you think of contact center, you probably don't think of education. Again, we just don't call it a contact center. We call it something different like homework help and yes. and that sort of a thing. But but the same thing is driving um, the need. And that is for that personal touch to be able to help people solve their problems and do it efficiently and effectively. And then everybody's happy. So when we take these technologies and these tools and add it into the mix, it only expands our ability to deliver on the promise of helping our students, helping our customers. Yeah. See, you know what, Michael, I, I, 
I'm going to add a point here, which might contradict the entire subject line, which Himanshu had brought up on the presentation. Yeah, and we were talking about, you were yeah. talking about humanizing the digital, right? Yeah. Yes. I'm actually saying it is digitizing the human today. Mm -hmm. Digitizing what the human is capable of doing mm -hmm. and supporting. So rather not, not either which way, it's, it's, it's providing, yeah. it's augmenting, uh, digitizing or augmenting the entire human capability to become better, a better version of what we are and what we will be in our roles and jobs in time to come. Yeah. It's so a balancing you keep, act. As you, as you keep yeah. mentioning, you know, it's about deflecting at the right point, right? Uh, and I've heard you speak a lot about it, right? Very passionately. Uh, it's a continuous loop, right? Humanizing the digital and digitizing the human, right? It goes on. It's continuous. The, the right set of deflectors at the right point. As yeah. Jatneet, you were mentioning, right? Uh, at times you are annoyed and you want to speak to a human, but at times you want more efficiencies, more scales, right? And that's where you want more uh, automation to be in the entire yeah. process. Yeah. Uh, Japneet, you also mentioned about the changing audience landscape. And would you know, you know, we have a very interesting, fascinating audience out here today. Uh, and the kind the spate of questions that I can see, you know, coming, popping up on our screens, uh, you have a busy next 13 minutes. Uh, you know, so we have a range of questions out there, uh, I think, and uh, we are right on time. Why not? Let's get started with uh, the Q&A, which the audience wants to, uh, you know, pick up on you from. Should we start? What do you think, Japni, Praveer? Uh, I, no, I think that's good. Uh, Himanshu, I don't have 13 minutes. I actually have to jump off at uh, five minutes before the webinar ends. So, yeah, um, yeah no, I think it's good. Uh, let's keep it interactive. Yeah, sure. So here's a question from John Tremor. Now he's asking, you know, what about getting training in AI, right? How do we get the training started? Are there any foundational sources that almost anyone should use when it comes to AI? Anyone that wants to take a stab at it? You know, let me let me jump in really quickly. Um, yeah. I'll jump in. I know you're at the leave a little bit earlier, so I'll I'll have you you also give your thoughts. But but I think that just um, being aware, like you don't. There's this concept called explainable AI, um, and and there is something to be said for understanding what is what is happening, right? The fact that it is processing data, it's not magic, it's not voodoo, um, and so understanding that I think is helpful. But the other thing I would recommend is if somebody isn't using even Chat GPT, and by the way, Chat GPT is one of dozens of of LLMs, you know, um, large language models that are out there. But but fine, let's just use Chat GPT as an example. Play around with it. If you haven't, then you should, because what you learn, to Prevere's point earlier, is that computers are dumb. They're, they only do what you tell it to do. So what I've learned over my course of, of interacting with AI is I have become better at asking questions. Or, Japneet, kind of like you with the, with the phone call, you're better at saying those things that you need to say to get you where you need to go. Again, this is an evolving technology. And so I think even that would be foundational learning. But uh, Jeffrey, what, what else would you say here? Uh, yeah, I, I think be curious, right? Like use AI to learn about AI. Um, I was I was actually looking into some uh, just even courses like within healthcare because you know I want to extend my knowledge on this. And um, th there's a lot that universities and colleges are offering as um, uh, AI in healthcare or AI in pharma or you know. So so there's a lot out there. I mean, I yeah. I definitely want to uh, want to do that. But um, go to Chat GPT and tell it to define AI and ask Chat GPT all these questions, and yeah. it'll tell you. <laughs> right. Well said. Well said, uh, Jeffy. Now, now there, there, are, there, there, are, there are training courses, etc. Whichever, you know, if you ask someone, and I'm sure all of you can type in right to Michael as well. He can point you to where the right teachers will tell you. But I think what Japneet and uh, Michael said both is, is absolutely, that, that's how I learned a lot when ChatGPT came in and how to use ChatGPT. I asked ChatGPT how to use ChatGPT. And, yeah. and, and it's just, you know, being very specific on the type of question that you're asking. And there are, uh, how should I put it? Uh, there are uh, actually language models, which are teaching you how to use language models. So if you just ask the GPT or any of these uh, that, how can I have a language model to teach me how to use a language model? You will get that language model within itself. So there's a lot there. 
Um, besides, there are training courses as well. If you have any questions on what type of foundation sources or courses anybody wants, uh, always shoot an email across to uh, myself or Himanshu or any one of us on, on this webinar. We'd be more than happy to uh, you know guide you towards those specific courses which can help you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Praveer. Uh, but the audience is not yet done, so we have more questions lined up for you. Uh, now, here's something from uh, Dennis Martin. What type of biometric data are captured by AI? Uh, you know, is this something that would only be applicable in an in-person environment? Uh, and, you know, I'm not sure, Japneet, are you still there with us? Michael? Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, or Japneet, thank you so much, right? So either one of you can want to, you know, take a stab at this one about the biometric data part of it. Uh, and is this applicable in just in-person environment or uh, otherwise? I'll, I'll just make one statement. I'll let Michael answer that. But I think the question needs to be reversed. Like, what biometric is not being captured? Like, I, I think everything's <laughs> on the table, right? Like Praveer said, it's not just like, don't think of data as, you know, words or numbers that you're seeing, uh, seeing on a screen. It's everything that's under observation. So everything is on the table. Yeah, but in addition to observation and speaking specifically about the uh, the projects that I've been involved in, uh, it, it can be a little bit cumbersome. So, for example, in a pilot or test mode, there were students who had a heart rate monitor, which, of course, applies to the, the, the bio and, and health side as well. Um, but there were other things where uh, it could track your eye movement. So it could track your eye movement as you're reading, or of course, it could track your eye movement if you're looking off to the side because you're no longer engaged. But other things like your body temperature, your heart rate, um, all being connected. Um, so at least in terms of its application within education, things were being tested. It is a little bit clunky because obviously who's going to want to wear a heart monitor or, or, or any special devices to to gather some of this biometric data, but but it's an idea. It's an idea that that is worth exploring. Again, if we take the healthcare side, well, then maybe if I'm having a, a, a telecall with my doctor, well, then yeah, I am hooked up with a monitor or something, but there's no limit to the biometric data that could in essence be captured if there was a thought that it could help with the predictive capabilities of AI. And that's ultimately what we wanna do is we wanna to try to anticipate to have a better customer experience. Michael, again, if you're wearing an eye watch, then, then you're, you're already being. <laughs> Which I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, I know. So here's yeah. another one for, for you, Michael, specifically. Uh, as we are talking about biometric data, right? More and more data. So it's a, it's a data, data everywhere, right? Uh, it also leads us uh, to the practices about data governance, regulation. Japneet, you mentioned about it earlier. This one is for you, Michael, you know, so how are we better managing or safeguarding student data privacy? So paramount for students and candidates out there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll take a brief pause to say thank you, Jeff Need. I know we know you have to, to jump off. Uh, great ch chatting with you as always. Uh, yeah, Thanks. absolutely. Um, thank you, everyone. I'm just going to leave you with one thing. Uh, and yeah. hopefully there's uh, folks from the pharma uh, space that are watching this webinar. Uh, but Morgan Stanley has estimated that in the next 10 years, there'll be 50 new therapies and $50 billion in sales um, um, uh, driven by AI. So, so that's uh, something to take note of. So I, I'd say just get with it, partner with AI. Yeah, so Japan, just tell us where to invest in. Or should we start <laughs> investing? In? I'm, I'm happy to just pull up and start putting some dollars left, right, center. <laughs> you got it, Praveer. You and me. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you. Thanks, uh, Japan, Imagine, thank you. you. Great, uh, so much, uh, great for facilitation. Bye-bye. Thanks, thank Japneet. Thank you. And, um, and well, to, to jump into that question, though, Himanshu, that you asked, student privacy, of course, is a very big thing. Uh, and, and a lot of what's being monitored is not just here in the U.S. So, for example, the EU um, is also doing its uh, regulation. Uh, the EU, in fact, just passed the AI Act not too long ago. And frankly, there are a lot of people not too happy with it. They think that it might stifle innovation. Um, and so there is this balance. We've talked about that before. In fact, Japneet talked about this balance. Well, the balance has to happen on the regulation side as well, because we have to encourage innovation, but we have to be mindful of the risks. And in the stand, you know, for, for things like student data, um, obviously things are anonymized. 
Um, and, and then only those who have the key, right, parents and students themselves, in many cases, even certain amounts of data being aggregated aren't even open to the teacher um, to, again, protect students. Uh, but, but this is part of that balancing act. Um, and, and I don't think we need to live in fear of it. I think we need to be very mindful. We need to be very respectful of it. But we have to push forward uh, because the opportunities are just too great if we don't keep plowing forward. No, I think, Michael, you, you said it right. Uh, the HIPAA regulations, you know, looking after the healthcare segment and, yeah. and the data on that side. Uh, and and uh, you've got GDPR regulations in Europe. Mm -hmm. So all these regulations actually even apply to anything and everything that has been captured by, by AI by any organization. So mind you, while Europe might have might be the first one to come out with the regulation around AI, but that's more around uh, the usage of AI, et cetera, and how AI uh, is impacting certain industries and what you can do with it. But uh, with all data and information that you're capturing on any side of the world is still governed by all data privacy acts. Uh, last year itself, uh, yeah. if I remember, the state of Los Angeles was LA was the first one, LA County. I think California was the first one to come out with rules and regulations around online proctoring. So, so those rules and regulations around data still apply. Yeah. So, you know, and, and people should not be privy of the fact that they go across so to answer the question for the audience, all data privacy rules and acts still apply, whatever does get captured through AI. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Praveer, I'm cognizant of the time. We have three minutes to go. Uh, but I have this one very fascinating question from Steve Rymel. Uh, and this is probably for you, Praveer. Uh, very interesting one. You know, let's have uh, let's read this out. So we understand that uh, a satisfied employee, employee leads to a satisfied customer. Right. And as we keep talking about customer experience out here, enhanced customer experience and all the AI tools. Now, what with all the AI tools that an agent has to deal with day on day, right? Uh, the virtual assistants, the conversational AI, the chatbots, uh, the, the range of data sources, omnichannel that an agent has to deal with. How is AI helping agent satisfaction? Oh, the very, very interesting point that you brought up. So a lot of, so what is an agent's role? An agent's role on uh, who is on the other side helping the customer is to make the customer's job easier, right? Yeah. With all these augmented tools and technology that comes in, it is making not only the resolution easier for the customer and providing the experience the way you want it with all the information, but it is also making the job of the agent easier. I mean, I can today look at all the information and answer really fast and get on with it and get on to the next job that I want to do, get on to the next customer that I want to do. <clears throat> Right. Then to get on to the next information that I want to take care of from an agent perspective, when an agent enters the contact centers today in, in, in our environment, um, you know, uh, what kind of job skill is the agent fit for? What kind of uh, pers pers personal preferences the agent has? All that is we are currently utilizing an AI tool to map that and put the agent or the personnel in the right job. The point is, if you're in the right job, in the right role, you are bound to be a more happier person than if you are in a place or a role, which while one, you might not be good at, or you're just doing it to make some money out of it. So I would look at it from both the perspectives, AI utilizing people to get the right role and the right job that they should be in the right fit men will make them a more happier person in the job that they're doing. And then the augmented technology Supporting them makes their job all that more easier. So it's it's just, you know, just living off the fly. And it's like one plus one is equal to two and not 2,500 into 250 plus 25 mi minus 600, 2,055 is equal to what? Now, what is the answer? One, one plus one is equal to two. And that's what AI helps you to do. Okay. Yeah. I would also like to take up one more question besides this. And I have been seeing that. Uh, an anonymous attendee mentioned, how can AI-driven contact centers be designed to specifically cater to diverse cultural nuances and mm. communication preferences of global customers across regions? So I, I will uh, chime in here and say, 
AI, that is where the human in the digital comes in or the digital in the, you know, the human side continues to exist. Uh, replicating cultural nuances and communication preferences is not where AI is today. I don't think AI is going to reach there for a very long time because cultural nuances and communication preferences and needs of people continue to change over a period of time. So, so, but at the same time, yes, AI can help augment on how to service these customers better. AI can help neutralize uh, me as an agent or me as a person in the contact center when I'm helping and assisting people from diverse geographies. So that neutralization can happen. The information can happen. However, the cultural replication and repli I would say not even replication, replacing someone understanding the culture and the communication still will not happen because that's a continuous evolution. I'm glad you brought that up, Prabir. I, I, I know we're, we're running over time, but I wanted to comment on that as well, because in education, and if we're talking about a proctor or we're talking about an educator helping in a homework help center, a student comes to them. So many students are English language learners and it, there are cultural and language issues and the technology only helps them. It's not going to replace yes. you know, the culture to culture, to your point, but the technology helps us help those students um and and that's only improving and only getting better well well said well, do we have another minute i want to answer another very important question <laughs> and, and, and yeah, of course you know Praveer, Praveer, you can take a minute but i would really uh you know you can take a minute I just, okay all right i'll do that i'll just take one can we say ai are nothing but invisible robots robots and also mistake done by ai in the process can have bigger damages than manual mistakes well, let me put it this way. Uh, I would not say they're invisible robots. I would say they're invisible assistants to you. Like any tool technology, your computer that is working today is an assistant for yourself. It is not, it, and you can use the coin, the term robo, but it is an assistant for yourself. Like your pen is an assistant when you write. Earlier in times, people used to use a, you know, a, a, a chalk to write on a marker, on, 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 a, on a board. So this is just the technology changing from a chalk to a pen and then pen from a laptop and a laptop from spoken speech to so and so forth. So let's take it that way and not in a manner. Mistakes will happen, can happen, and will continue to happen over a period of time. But as I had pointed out earlier in my discussion as well, we all continue to work together towards mitigating. Let's create a bigger antivirus than the virus, always. Yeah. Thank you. Love Thank that. you, Manchu, for that extra 30 seconds. Thank you so much for <laughs> I couldn't resist uh, myself. Extra 30 seconds at, I uh, believe it's 1 p.m. your time, Praveen? Uh, no, that's all right. It's just that's daytime for me, right? Don't worry about it. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, uh, so thank you so much, Praveen. Uh, and also for our audience, right, uh, for the patients, especially for those uh, from the Asian countries, Australasia, uh, it's really, really late. Uh, and, you know, so must appreciate the audience for their patience. Uh, for staying up so late, uh, but you know, if I was the audience, uh, you know, Praveer, I won't mind, you know, going another 15, 20 minutes extra for this fascinating topic. <laughs> uh, and and the way, you know, uh, Michael, Japni, Praveer, uh, you have been bringing in a lot of perspectives. I'm sure, you know, we need a sequel. Uh, we need a follow up uh, on lot many questions uh, that our audience have. Uh, there are some of them, guys. Uh, we may not be able to take all of it because of time constraints. Uh, but thanks to all of you for joining in. What you will see out there on your pane uh, would be, we are talking about customer experiences, right? And it's hard to not uh, ask for customer experience, your own feedback before uh, winding up this entire webinar. So please uh, put in your feedback about various facets and features of this particular webinar. Uh, you know, there is, a, there is a score out there you can see. Uh, and also any other uh, freewheeling comments about you know, what could have been better, what is already better, and what are the possible topics you would like to see in the future uh, in this entire series, in the space of CX and AI and contact centers. Yeah, uh, and I would just like to take uh, you know, a minute uh, to wrap it up uh, this entire discussion. Uh, as we have seen in today's discussion, it's important for enterprises today uh, to differentiate where AI and technology would play prime and where the human touch needs to be defined. 
it's crucial as you have been mentioning uh, praveer right uh, to humanize the digital but at the same time digitize the human to create customer experiences that are personal engaging customized authentic uh, at the same time it is crucial to create human to human edge to edge right we say b2b B2 b2c but more important is edge to edge human to human interactions that are augmented by ai technologies look at technologies as an assistant rather than a a robot challenging you right it's there to collaborate simply because the future as we think uh, and i i would think you know our audience would agree so would you praveer michael it's not human versus ai as we keep hearing in so many debates uh, rather the future is about human plus ai collaboration right it's it's this collaboration that could build seamless loops between man and machine and deliver customer experiences praveer to borrow borrow from your line customer experience the way you want it do you think it sums it up well or you would have another line to add to it praveer or michael before we uh, uh, pitch that's uh, great our audience yeah that's all right thank you and next time you have a webinar uh, i i'll charge you for it that's all <laughs> thanks a lot appreciate <laughs> yeah and thank you for the invitation again i i think yeah, it's thanks, great that, thanks for inviting us uh, that you brought education into this conversation and and, and thank thanks for the participants and everybody else as well really appreciate your time yep. thank you all wonderful thank, thank you thank you see yep. you bye bye